Uh, my name is Jim Wolf. I am a licensed marriage and family counselor in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm here uh, today, uh, it's March 18th, 1996. I'm here today with Dr. Henry Stein, director of the Alfred Adler Institute of San Francisco. Uh, he is a, a practitioner of and teacher of classical Adlerian psychology, perhaps uh, the foremost uh, proponent of classical Adlerian psychology uh, around today, at least in, around here. <laughs> so, uh, Henry, uh, uh, c could you, uh, you know, f tell us a little bit about your background? Any, uh, anything you think is relevant for your uh, interest in psychology? Uh, uh, your development as a as a as a person as a human being, uh, whatever has led you to follow the path uh, you've been on. It's. Um, well, that's not too vague. <laughs> no, it, 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 it's it's kind of challenging. Uh, what helps is having been through a study analysis with Sophia De Vries and getting some insight into, at least from her eyes, you know what my my roots were. Um, I think probably what um, are some of my uh, strongest roots, I would say, are philosophical. And so far as when I was in my um, early teens, I had a very passionate search for meaning, for understanding. I couldn't say I was interested in psychology at that time, but I did have an inter interest in philosophy and a good friend of mine also had an interest and we would sit together um, and talk about Jean-Paul Sartre. The meaning of existentialism life. Existentialism and the meaning of life. And this mm -hmm. was wonderful, especially if two kids in the Bronx who were uh -huh. sort of playing stickball in the afternoon and then mm -hmm. take a break and have a uh -huh. two cents plane or you know, chocolate soda. Uh -huh. and then we would talk about philosophy and he actually introduced me uh, to these ideas which were very provocative. Mm. And so the idea of what does life mean and uh, why are we here, uh, what is this all about, was, was quite fascinating. Mm. Um, we also went to Hebrew school together, mm. preparing for our bar mitzvahs. Mm. Uh, but we wanted something a little broader than what was being taught mm. in Hebrew school. Mm. And so that's where it started. That's where I think where the thirst began. Um, I know there's there's a strong uh, intellectual tradition in Judaism. Uh, uh, it sounds like you you, you grew up uh, with some uh, religious uh, uh, religious training. A little and, bit uh, 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 enough to get me to my bar mitzvah. Okay. <laughs> 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 right, uh, but yeah, there is a tradition uh, there which I did appreciate, which is mm -hmm. that of, of questioning, mm -hmm. of discussing, lots of discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, that was, I would say, w w was, was quite nourishing. Was there intellectual stimulation in your family? Uh, a modest amount. Mm -hmm. First of all, my father died when I was seven years old. So there was a period when I did not have a paternal figure in, in the home. Uh, my mother had to really work very hard to kind of uh, keep us together. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, to some degree, my brother, who's three years younger, and I were kind of on our own. Uh, although she took good care of us and you know, was very responsible, we had to do an awful lot. Um, and so, a lot of my education was essentially going to the library and getting books and mm -hmm. um, finding these sources myself. Yeah. I must say, my early interest prior to philosophy was in art and in painting and in drawing. Uh, and uh, that was also very nourishing. It was sort of, I guess you could say it was feeding the spirit uh, at a very early age. My mother was very encouraging uh, at that level. And I had an aunt and uncle who were both um, musicians. Uh, my uncle was a concert pianist. And my aunt was a music teacher. And I remember visiting their home and being introduced to more philosophy and uh, the arts, and that was quite fascinating. It sounds like I'm um, thinking of uh, community feeling and social interest. It sounds as you know, as you're talking about your family, that there was a sense of connectedness 
uh, with friends and, and family that you, you There had. was, yeah. Um, it, that was one thing I did a lot of sort of like about the family. There was a kind of a warmth and a, and a family feeling. Although I can't say every member of my family was delightful. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had an uncle from hell. Oh. Uh, and was that on uh, father's brother, mother's brother? It was actually uh, mother's brother-in-law. I hope this is not being traced. <laughs> <laughs> Confidentiality <laughs> issue. <laughs> okay. uh, but I, I do recall he was a very autocratic and very dominating man. Mm. And uh, I did not like him. And I created a little bit of a disturbance in the family when I stood up to him. Mm. Uh, and I was told I'd better apologize and don't talk that mm -hmm. way. And I said his behavior was objectionable. Mm -hmm. yeah, but he's your uncle. I don't care who he is. <laughs> so that got me into a little bit of trouble, but mm -hmm. I felt it was a worthwhile dispute. Well, what, I, what I hear is a strong democratic impulse from, uh, from I guess the you could call that. Or it so. was uh, rebellious at the time. Okay. It's like you sort of, you know, American Revolution, don't tread on me, okay. is the feeling. And okay. that was a good strong feeling I had yeah. uh, very early. Yeah. Um, and my mother wasn't entirely happy with that, mm. nor was my uncle. <laughs> Do you think uh, 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 you, you lost your, your father at a, at a young age, and uh, uh, do you think that the, the absence of, of a father figure uh, uh, was a, a, a strong force in, in your life? Uh, did, you, did you look for something to fill that gap? Uh, I was wondering if, you know, you, if the interest in philosophy was kind of a, a searching for a, for a path. I think that's a good point. Uh, I did feel that influence missing, and I had to, I guess you could say, sublimate it in mm -hmm. a way. Um, uh, I had a couple of very fine uncles, but I didn't really spend much time with them. I had an uncle who lived in Ohio, and I looked up to him very much, mm -hmm. um, uh, a scientist who um, I thought was wonderful, but I, I didn't, he was at mm -hmm. a distance. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the idea of looking for a, um, an influential paternal figure must have been there maybe unconsciously. Mm -hmm. I don't think I was aware of, of okay. doing that. But I think it helps explain why when I was involved in the arts, I drifted somewhat into architecture and became mm -hmm. passionately interested in the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. Okay. And, um, that was a p period when I thought, well, gosh, it would be the most wonderful thing in the world to go to Taliesin in Arizona and study with him. And I actually went to um, school studying architecture at Cooper Union, New York. Mm -hmm. But knowing what was wonderful architecture and then having a sense of what I was capable of, I just didn't feel that I had the vision to become mm -hmm. an architect. And that later on, I realized what the problem was it was the limitation at three-dimensional visualization, mm. in part, and the other factors too. Uh, how long were you on that that uh, path in architecture? How long? Oh, did quite you a few years, um, because uh, I went to Cooper Union for several years at night, but then I went into the army, and I came out of the army. So I got probably a couple of years seriously, and mm. then architecture always in the background as mm -hmm. a kind of a, call it a hobby okay. or just a, a cultural uh, interest. But the figure of Wright was there okay. as a, uh, a man mm -hmm. who I could imagine would be wonderful to study with mm -hmm. and be with. Uh, did you find any strong role models in the army? <laughs> I'm, I'm making a joke. <laughs> <laughs> what would save uh, me in the army was yeah. humor. Okay. Humor. I looked at this thing and I said, some of this stuff is unbelievably absurd. Uh -huh. If I take it seriously, I'm going to be a very unhappy guy. Uh -huh. And so I basically yeah. uh, began uh, to make fun of it mm -hmm. in a way without getting into trouble. Uh -huh. I amused myself and some other people at the time. Okay. Uh, you could say I was somewhat of a company clown, uh -huh. but I could play both sides because I also made Soldier of the Week. <laughs> And after I did that, I decided I'd had enough of that. 
<laughs> I mean, how much good behavior can you tolerate? Okay. Right. Uh, so uh, you, uh, I assume you spent maybe two years or two uh, years, two years in the army. In the army, yeah. And, uh, I was happy to get uh, out. And uh, so you went, you went back to school after that, or where? where yeah, well, in the army, I studied. Uh, they put me in mapping school, so yeah. I had a chance to do something fairly interesting, yeah. uh, drawing maps. But while I was in the army, I discovered the theater. I was frankly mm. bored, and I was beginning to consider taking correspondence classes in engineering mm. and stuff. And uh, uh, how uh, how did you discover the theater in the army? Ah, uh, uh, that was. Um, somewhat of an impulse, but it was interesting. As I told you, I wasn't too wild about the, uh, the whole structure of the army. I realized that it was somewhat necessary along certain lines to, you know, to train people in this mm -hmm. way for military service. But one day as I was in Louisville, Kentucky, and I w was reading the um, Post newspaper, and they were holding tryouts for uh, a play, I think it was a musical, called At War with the Army. <laughs> And it suddenly grabbed me. It's like, it's like this, <laughs> this means something to me. And I went down. I had no theater training, but I thought, if, if that's what they're doing, here's a place where I can express myself. <laughs> <laughs> they never did the play, but they uh -huh. did something else, and they needed actors. I was totally inexperienced. Uh -huh. But I got in a play, and I found that it was very interesting. And it was uh -huh. part of my, I guess you say, artistic impulse coming out. Yeah, in a way. So, uh, but it sounds like that 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 sparked a, a very strong interest, and uh, uh, you went in that direction. Yeah, for, I uh, basically I time. moved out of. Well, I had go, first gone in the direction of architecture. Realized that my interest in mathematics maybe was a little st stronger than my capacities as an architect. I went to engineering for a little bit. This is before the army. Okay. Then in the army, I discovered the theater, and then after I got out of the service, actually, for one point when I was a few months from leaving the service station in San Francisco, I got involved in theater again out here. Uh, and that was not post-theater, but theater you know, um, uh, in San Francisco. And I decided to go back to school and study theater. It was that interesting to me. Uh, was that in New York? Uh, in San Francisco. Yeah. So I went to San Francisco State University. Mm -hmm. uh, I continued my and finished my bachelor's degree. Uh, how old were you at this point? Uh, was that well, early 20s? Uh, yeah, 21 to 23, so maybe 23 years old, 24 okay. years old. Uh, and then I, I continued on and got my, uh, went for my master's degree in theater. Still at San Francisco San State? San Francisco yeah. State. And I went from a variety of learning acting uh, and set design. I was quite good at set design. But my art background mm -hmm. helped. My architecture background helped, too. And I found that set design was more compelling to me than, than architecture in some respects. But then I discovered directing, and that got me very interesting. What was it about directing that grabbed you? It was the issue of translating what people think and feel into movement. Hmm. And it was also, I, I guess from a very early age, I had an interest, I wanted to understand people, and I didn't know how I was going to do that. And in the theater, one portrays character, and if you portray a character, you have to have some kind of understanding. Of human nature. Of human yeah. nature. Yeah. And while I was in the theater, I discovered the uh, works of Konstantin Stanislavsky, the great Russian director and theoretician. And he started, he started me studying what it meant to analyze a fictional character. I was also taking acting lessons mm -hmm. here in San Francisco from a fine teacher. Uh, what was it about uh, Stanislavsky's uh, view of human nature uh, that uh, well, I'm not sure if he, he, if he actually said human nature. I think he was talking about fictional character, but it's like mm -hmm. trying to make it lifelike. Okay. And what he said was that in order to understand a character, one has to establish what is the character's super objective, he called it. His overall mm -hmm. goal. His fictional okay. goal. Okay. Yeah, okay. I thought, oh, this is wonderful stuff. Mm -hmm. This appealed to me aesthetically. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he said you had to break it down into smaller units. And all he said about 
developing a character, analyzing a play, made a great deal of sense to me, and it was was quite fascinating. And I still didn't really connect it with psychology yet, but it was just sort of an understanding of a person artistically, if you could say that. But then the more I got involved in directing, the more I realized that what I was learning through the theater was not quite enough, wasn't quite deep enough about human nature. Uh, so I imagine uh, directing, uh, I mean, you're uh, in some ways, man you know, managing the actors. So you're, you're uh, uh, I would assume that you're dealing with fictional characters, but you're dealing with the actors and actresses themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And probably there's drama on a lot of levels oh, there. Oh, yes, yeah. That's one thing the theater did give me was an incredible workout both in terms of interpersonal relationships, dealing with crises. I mean, if you want a place where there's a crisis, mm. frequently, you know, work in the theater. Uh, they're just all over the place. Um, and you're right, it's the, the fictional character was one perspective. How do I make this person seem real? Well, the audience kept them. And then here's this real character with very real problems who has to adapt to this character. You know, you have an actor who, let's say, has great insecurities and is playing somebody who does not, you know, things like that. So that was quite fascinating, and that demand started me searching. And I logically went in the direction of psychology. What can it teach me about? Well, I wonder, you say logically, but I, I'm not sure that anyone would have gone in the direction of psychology. Well, I, 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 because, I, uh, uh, I'm not sure that other theater directors have <laughs> uh, pursued well, that's this That's a good path. point. What well, seemed logical to me, yes, that's okay. a good point. Okay. Or at least, I, I like to uh, browse. I call, okay. Somebody called it the grazing principle. Okay. I used to go up to the library uh -huh. and graze through there, uh -huh. you know, and intuitively, uh -huh. you know, pick out stuff and look at it, uh -huh. and um, um, playing hunches. And that's one thing that I have trusted for a long time is playing hunches. So I'd go up and I'd spend some time, and then I thought to myself, well, how am I going to find out more about, you know, analyzing? I read all of Stanislavski's books. I'd read the works of, of Michael Chekhov on building character. Uh, I read the works of other people. And I thought, well, this is quite fascinating. And I think I'd come across something in some of the theater journals probably about Freudian interpretation of Hamlet or something like that. I said, oh, these people are looking. So I went to the library and started looking at books about, on, by Freud. And I read some of the material and I thought to myself, I don't know how I'm going to use this in the theater. I just don't know. Maybe it's true, but I don't know how I'm going to use and it. And does anything in particular jump out at you uh, when you, uh, in this recollection of reading Freud? Well, to translate everything into a sexual impulse, it seemed to me, to the theater, was a distortion of how I wanted to or, uh, interpret plays or what playwrights have um, uh, contemplated or considered. But in fairness, I, I also looked at the work of Jung, and I thought this is fascinating. Uh, but once again, it was like it was very involved and very deep, but how am I going to use this? And you know, it, it didn't grab me right away. Not that I studied it in, in its entirety, but uh, I sampled. Was it in the sampling, this browsing, that you came across something by Adler? Yeah, I came across one of Adler's books. I think it probably was what life should mean to you at that time. The minute I started reading his work, I connected with it. I mean, the minute I, I said, this makes sense, this paragraph makes sense, this whole chapter makes sense. And not only that, I said, I can use this. And then it hit me like a thunderbolt. He's saying the same thing about real people that Stanislavski said the about fictional objective. character. I thought, oh my God, this is unbelievable. So that got me all fired up. Okay. Where did, now, was that your first uh, real exposure to psychology during this Absolutely. period? Absolutely, yeah. Had you ever been in therapy or, or uh, been in an encounter group? Uh, I think the human potential movement was uh, getting going at that yeah, point. Yeah, but that was it? not something that was, yeah, after all, um, being involved 
But being at school, being involved in the theater, and mm -hmm. also having to work and support a family, all of this was, mm -hmm. I didn't have much time for much else, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and at that point, I guess I was, I wouldn't say I didn't need therapy, mm -hmm. but it wasn't on my mind. <laughs> you say you were working in addition to uh, going to school and being involved in the theater. Were you working in the theater at that point? Or were Not for, for my, I, I, basically I was going to school with the GI Bill, which wasn't enough, mm -hmm. okay. Um, and, um, but I had to supplement that by, I was working on campus, mm -hmm. So I worked in the audiovisual department, and I worked in the AV department showing films. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and I got so interested that I um, thought, wouldn't it be interesting, this is at San Francisco State, to see really good films, because mm -hmm. they weren't. And I started a film series out there. Mm. And I said, well, why not? Um, and since I was, oh, we knew how to use a projector, mm -hmm. And I found out one could rent films. And so I started a very modest film festival mm -hmm. there. You know, charged something like 50 cents or something mm -hmm. like that. And we got to see Akito Kurosawa's films mm -hmm. and great French films and mm -hmm. Italian films and Olivier's films, mm -hmm. yeah, all the stuff, mm -hmm. 50 cents, 75 cents. Mm -hmm. And it really started to develop. And we went from a tiny little room, you know, into with a big, I remember one time, we, uh, I was able to get Olivier's Hamlet, and we showed up at the main theater, and we sold out. There were people around the block. <laughs> I was in show business. That sounds exciting. <laughs> well, it was exciting. It was, it was, it was marvelous. But anyway, that was one of the jobs. I didn't make any money doing this film festival. That was just for fun. But you know, I would show films for classes and be paid by the hour and that sort of thing. I worked in the library for a while. And, but then I also needed to make money in the summer, so I worked as a draftsman, mm. using my old engineering skills. Yeah. So that was a pretty busy period. Now, as you uh, uh, read, uh, getting back to psychology, uh, uh, I remember uh, at some point uh, you uh, made contact with Sophia, or perhaps some other Adlerians. So. Yeah. Well, what happened is, once I started reading these Adler books in the library, and San Francisco had a fair number of them. Mm -hmm. I was hooked. It was fascinating. But I reached a point where it's like, are there people who really use this, who you know, mm -hmm. believe it, who, I mean, I mean, it's, God, wouldn't it have been great to meet Adler, or at least meet an Adlerian? Mm -hmm. And then I think I read in one of the books, um, uh, or it may have been one of the journals that I probably picked up, that there was a society, a North American society for Adlerian psychology. So I contacted them. I said, are there any Adlerians in San Francisco? And they gave me the names of three people. I Do said, I've got to meet somebody. Do you remember the names of uh, all three? Well, yeah, I remember the names, but for the sake of diplomacy, I'll only mention one. Okay. okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I went to see one man who was a delightful man. Um, who had studied in Europe. Um, and I, I wanted essentially to find, not only find out more about it, but I also wanted to, to study with a person like that. I didn't know exactly how one did this. And he was quite delightful, but he was involved in a project uh, to uh, create some kind of special department at a university here. And he was, all he was interested in was doing that, and he asked me if I would be interested in helping him do that, and I said, well, not really, <laughs> I've got something I wanted to do. So he, he was interesting, but his focus was different. And I also spoke to another person who seemed very bright and very knowledgeable, but my feeling was that um, the way she behaved and her attitude was antithetical to Adler's ideas, his philosophy, and I, I, I did not feel comfortable with her. Mm. Um, and so I thought to myself, no, this woman contradicts mm. in her behavior what she talks mm. about. So because someone claims they're Adlerian, they may not really uh, uh, live Adler's philosophy. Well, they may not only claim, they may even understand the theory. Mm. But if they don't internalize it and digest it and live it, then they become a contradiction, perhaps not only to the students, but to the clients. 
And uh, I've attended a number of conventions, and this is something I've become quite sensitive to, and Sophia has helped me become sensitive to it, and that is to really be what we call a classical Lemurian. One has to internalize the theory, the philosophy, and one has to bring oneself in line with that um, so that it's a living, breathing thing for you. Uh, if not, it creates problems. So Sophia was the only one of the three who it seemed to me was a kind of a living example of what this was about, and so I worked with her. Do you recollect your first encounter and first impression of her? Sophia? Oh, yeah. Went to her home in the Oakland Hills. <clears throat> She was a very warm, a very gracious woman, woman of great dignity, um, a very giving woman, a very accepting woman. And she invited me in, and we sat and we talked on her deck for a while. It was, it was the summertime. And we discovered that we had a lot in common, and particularly our interest in architecture and Frank Lloyd Wright and the arts. And um, I felt an affinity with her initially. She was a person who was very bright, very sharp, and could almost like see through you, mm -hmm. in a way, but in a, in a comfortable way. Mm -hmm. It's like you wanted to be see, <laughs> to see, to see through you. Uh, and I essentially asked her what she would suggest. I told her I was deeply interested. And um, what I really thought I wanted at the time, what I told her was that I wanted to learn about Larian psychology so I could not only sort of apply it to myself, but apply it to my work in the theater. How old were you at this point? Oh gosh, let's see. So this would have been fifties in the late fifties, so mm -hmm. my late twenties. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Maybe a year later than that. I, I'd have to double mm -hmm. check that. Um, you were you were married at this time, and I was, had, I was had married. Children and had a couple of children. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. and. Um, I forget the question. <laughs> well, I was wondering. I asked you about your. Uh, I, I wanted to get kind of a time frame uh, uh, when this ah. your encounter happened. Um, but I asked you about your first impression oh, of her with, and with, uh, with, with the Sophia. first encounter and what. The, what yeah. What, well, what, that what, was what, like. what came out of it was her recommendation, which was she suggested I do a study analysis with her, mm -hmm. which was I could continue studying Adlerian psychology from the books that I had and ones that she would suggest that I would, uh, she would help me understand the theoretical part, mm -hmm. but that we would also apply it to me and my life and my difficulties, and I was having some personal difficulties at the time, mm -hmm. and then we would also apply it to my work in the theater. Mm -hmm. So I would see her on a weekly basis, mm -hmm. and I would do a great deal of reading. I was, I was mm -hmm. reading practically nothing else but Adler at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And it did help my work in the theater. And it did help me in my personal relationship. Uh, is that something you feel comfortable talking about in a little more detail? I was. Uh, Whatever. <laughs> it's your tape. Well, <laughs> well, really, what I'm interested in is yeah. you know, kind of you know how you uh, as a, as a, as a unique individual, yeah. uh, you know, develop how just a, kind of your path to becoming a therapist and this commitment in your life. Uh, 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 was, uh, you know, so I, I'm not sure how much. Well, anyway, do you understand what I'm asking? Uh, not exactly. Okay. Uh, well, uh, it just seems to me that uh, you know, becoming a therapist, especially an Adlerian therapist. Uh, we are, we have to work on it, you know. We have to work on ourselves, and uh, you, you have to you have to square away, uh, uh, you know, who you are. You have to live, the, as you said, live the live the philosophy, and uh, mm -hmm. I mean, finding courage to overcome difficulties. And uh, uh, I'm just really uh, interested in what your you know it, personal experiences have been that have added to your development of, as a therapist, maybe. Uh, things you've continued to overcome uh, at a personal level t that has uh, contributed uh, to this development. Okay, that's fine. 
Well, Sophia really helped me see some of the things that I needed to conquer, mm -hmm. uh, both in my personal and professional life. You know, one of the things that I needed to, uh, to conquer in my professional life was making a very full commitment to the theater or whatever mm -hmm. that I was doing, which I was tempted to do, but you know, the theater is a tough business to make it in, mm -hmm. and you're also having a family. Um, there was a certain insecurity about being able to do that. So that I, since I was working full time and going, you know, doing the theater mm -hmm. at night, and you know, it was double duty, mm -hmm. But it was psychologically based on a certain insecurity, too. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, one could go into the theater full time, right? But it would have been one hell of a gamble, mm -hmm. right? That was one issue. Another issue that had to be dealt with was, in fact, going back to the roots of losing my father when I was mm -hmm. very young. Mm -hmm. And she made a very wonderful suggestion, and she introduced me to another therapist man who had a practice in Walnut Creek and she had met him and she also had um, heard about his work doing marathon group treatment mm. and his name was Joe Potts who also happened to be not only a therapist but a minister mm. and she said she thought it might be interesting for me to meet him or even to work with him a little bit while I was working with her I met I went to see him, and um, he invited me to participate in a marathon. And I was right at the time when I needed to be working through something emotionally. Mm -hmm. And I participated in a two and a half day marathon, started Friday evening and went to Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. I mean, boy, that was something. With about, uh, I guess, 10 or 12 people. And I was amazed at what he did. Mm -hmm. I was absolutely amazed at what he did with great imagination, with mm. great passion, with great insight. He was not an Adlerian. Um, I think he was kind of a mixture of, of Rogers and Byrne and mm. some the Goulings and God knows what else, but he was very creative. And it sounds like this laid the foundation for the marathon work you were to yeah, do later on. Yeah. But I think he also represented a paternal figure who was very strong and loving and sophisticated. I mean, if he, and I had a personal relationship with him. He also encouraged me to participate in his weekly groups. And since I had already studied psychodrama, he said, why don't you try out what you know here? Mm -hmm. He gave me some free reign, which I thought was very encouraging. So you wound up co-leading the group with him, essentially? Or Experiment. Experiment. Right. I hadn't had any real training, but the point is, I was making these connections between psychology and the theater, and then psychodrama was halfway in between, mm -hmm. and I'd studied a little bit of psychodrama, uh, but I had no place to practice it, and he said, here, practice on these people. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you feel about it, group? They said, fine, you know, he can't hurt us. Mm -hmm. That sounds like you were, uh, what, what jumps out of me is like permission to be creative and experiment. And, uh, right. I mean, the man was saying, hey, there. trust you, go ahead and try yeah. it out. If you get into trouble, mm -hmm. I'll step in. And so it was a combination of the marathon experience with him and the group work and the encouragement that I got in group, I think, did something to me there, which was all the psychology that I had been learning and playing in the theater and using dramatically and trying to represent character, I now had a chance to be working with people to help them, mm -hmm. the other members of the group. Mm -hmm. And the feedback was, it was helpful. Mm -hmm. I went, right. wow, you know, hey, that's all right. So it was a kind of a, va a validation for right. something maybe, I mean, I look at the expression on your face, a validation for something maybe you didn't realize was there. Well, I did, yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't make the connection that I uh -huh. could be in, th in psychology or be a therapist. I thought, I know a lot about psychology and I'm using it in the theater and in my life. And I figured, well, I, that's, that's neat. But now it was given this opportunity of trying stuff out and realizing I'm actually helping somebody. Actually, what I did was I went back, uh, still working with Sophia, and I said, uh, I'm excited uh, about a new direction. <laughs> <laughs> so the feeling was it sounds like excitement and uh, opt some kind of optimism. And 
an optimism and a, a, a searching for where is the right place. The, the theater was, you see, architecture was interesting and fascinating. Engineering was interesting and fascinating. But it was not really the right place for me. It was, it was not a, a terrific fit. Okay? And theater was a fascinating period, and I loved it. But it was not really the right place. It didn't use everything properly. Um, and when I got one step into psychology, I began to feel, oh my God, this is going to use it all. And I got very excited so about it, that. It all came together. Okay. Okay. I don't know if I answered your prior oh, question well, about yeah, the roots yeah, here. But, yeah. um, uh, <coughs> well, I, you know, I was thinking, trying to think of another question here, but where, where from here? I mean, here, so you, so you, you're, you're in the group with uh, uh, Joe Potts and uh, uh, seeing, seeing Sophia, and uh, and, and then did a, did you formulate a plan at that point for yourself? Well, actually, what happened was I was getting close to it. I was tempted because mm -hmm. I was still got one foot in that theater. And um, but then a rather shocking thing happened. Joe Potts died in a heart attack. How long had you been working with him at that point? Gosh, I probably maybe as much as a year, mm -hmm. longer. I built a very good relationship with him, and he'd even introduced me to another man. Uh, somebody had asked him to teach some psychology seminars mm -hmm. for business sort of simplified psychology, sort of like a transaction analysis type. Okay. okay. And because he was... Uh, T groups, is that one? Not a T group, okay. it was a TA. T -A group, like okay. a T is sensitivity training. And Joe said, I don't have time to do that. He says, get Henry to do it. But Joe, I don't know <laughs> about it. He says, you're close enough, do some reading. He says, you mm -hmm. can handle yourself in front of a group. And he introduced me to this man, and I started doing some psychology seminars for business. Simplified psychology. And how did that go? Very well. Mm -hmm. I built a wonderful relationship with the man who later became my partner as we did not only seminars for business, but we did special roundtable seminars for business leaders. Uh, who, was, who was that? Bill Henretti. Oh, Bill. Yeah, he's still a dear friend to this day. Yeah. And Bill had a wonderful, he was an entrepreneur, one of these high-flying entrepreneurs, full of principle, full of sympathy, he was an unusual person. Mm -hmm. But he'd take chances and try stuff out and didn't work, he'd try something else. Mm -hmm. And we did something called Executive Roundtable, which we did for a couple of years, that was wonderful. We brought together a group of CEOs of companies and other entrepreneurs, and we brought them together once a month for continuing education, and I would teach them psychology, and Bill would be involved with a lot of financial and marketing stuff, and then we'd have a brain trust of everybody helping each other, and it was one hell of a think tank. Mm -hmm. We spent the whole day together, and they loved it. Mm -hmm. And then Bill discovered that, that he was teaching people how to do well in business and make money and do things beautifully, and he decided, why don't I apply these <laughs> principles myself? And which he did, and went off in the direction of real estate development, because mm -hmm. we'd also had done a seminar for mm -hmm. real estate people. And Where did that leave you? Well, that didn't leave me anyway. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was doing this actually as a way of making the transition out of theater okay. into psychology, and it yeah. allowed me to make a living while I was going to school, because mm -hmm. I'd gone back to school to get my master's degree okay. at San Francisco State. So, you know, they say this transition. So what, uh, what, what year, just for to get a time this frame? This is right? probably the mid-60s now. Okay. Um, and, uh, well, going back to one thing, Joe's death. When Joe died, I had not yet made the commitment to psychology. It hit me very hard. I remember just crying my eyes out mm -hmm. when I heard the news. Um, but I guess the way I healed myself at that time from his loss, because that was the second loss of an oh, important man, man in my life, okay? I thought to myself, I'm going to carry on his work. And that 
that was it. And I'm going to definitely go in the field of psychology. I want to become an Adlerian, okay. But that he had taught me some things that I did not want to let fade away or just, you know, not be used. So I think it was a kind, it's almost, it's not that he had a deathbed wish or anything like that, but it's like I personally said, he's given me something and I want to use it. I want to give it back. So at that point, I went back to school. Uh, I applied to several schools, was uh, admitted to San Francisco State. And I think what allowed me to do that was the, f the working as an uh, instructor and consultant with this business organization because I had flexibility and I could make enough money that I could go to school. Right. Do internships. And yeah, like everything that. together. So that, that was a very fortunate combination. Uh, uh, in graduate school, what was your experience uh, there? You were exposed to other psychologies? And, yeah, it was uh, basically pretty good. Um, I, I got a great deal for my uh, graduate work at San Francisco State. There were some people who I found fascinating and inspiring. Uh, not everybody, but mm -hmm. it was enough that it kind of got me launched. Uh, who were perhaps some of the uh, people who uh, well, were inspiring? Jim, Jim Winfrey was very supportive and very encouraging mm -hmm. um, and really showed me a great deal about you know, how a therapist could be super sensitive to, the, to people and responsive and open. Some people may think he's somewhat permissive okay. <laughs> in a way, but you know, that, that was quite, okay. quite delightful. Uh, Lou Falick was very challenging. Uh, he certainly was not a Lindlerian, but uh, he was open to my ideas and um, um, encouraged me to, you know, mm -hmm. to be uh, more explicit with him. Uh, ben Art was quite wonderful. Uh, his, his work with Abraham, he introduced me to the work of Abraham Maslow. Okay, who was for that I owe him a great debt, right. yes, yeah. and also a very inspiring man. Very a challenging, also demanding professor, but I loved it. Absolutely love that. Um, so I had a great time there. Yeah, okay. um, and uh, I know uh, at State they emphasize internships. How you had done an internship, uh, at least I think at Catholic Social Service. Catholic Social Service Marin, yeah. and uh, uh, there I, I, I met Tom Hurley, who right. was the um, director, and also very encouraging and also very interested in Adlerian work. He was a Jungian, I believe, at the time. Um, and he made it possible to me to do some very creative work there. Um, uh, I was able to do some work with children, uh, with play therapy there. Um, I was able to start parent education workshops at Catholic Social mm -hmm. Service. And eventually they even made it possible for me to become a school consultant to the Catholic school in San Rafael. Mm -hmm. And I set up a program there. Kind of challenging, exciting. Uh, I remember, uh, at least uh, in your your practice, uh, if, uh, if I remember you telling me that uh, it was largely built on uh, doing uh, work with kids and in schools, doing parent working with parents. Yeah, well, and also another interesting thing happened when I was there. Um, some woman came to see me, um, named Elise Webster, and she was the director of the. Um, Children's Cultural Center of Marin, in Marin City, at the time, or Sausalito. Um, and she said, would you be interested in doing an Adlerian workshop for our school? I said, sure, why not? Went out and did that, and it was a wonderful success. Mm -hmm. And we've done, we did them for years afterwards. And as a result of that, I was able to work with parents, with teachers, with children, and I was able to carry out the idea of doing family therapy that I really wanted to, which is like full service. You have a child with problems, you observe the child in school, you talk to the teacher, you talk to the director, you do a home visit, you work with the parents, you work with the child, now you know what's going on. And getting back to your relationship with Sophia, I mean, I assume that all, through all this you're still meeting with Sophia and consulting with her and uh, uh, well, what happened was after completing my study analysis with her and going back to school, I began to see her for supervision. 
and I would discuss every case with her. Uh, in some case, I used to have two-hour sessions with her to sometimes discuss the case because I wanted to go through every nook and cranny of it. And I, that's the way I learned the craft, which was to take it apart and put it back together with her. Uh, you know, at what point, uh, you know, at, at what, uh, at what point did you think about teaching at Larian Psychology? Maybe I'm getting too far ahead no, of us. No, no, that's that's fine. Mm. It, w it was after uh, quite a bit of work with her, where mm. I, what I did was I discussed, and I, for some reason, maybe it was my audiovisual background, I just was sharp enough to tape everything. Okay. <laughs> From, I just got started from taping the beginning, from or? the beginning, and I uh -huh. ended up with, I don't know, four or five hundred tapes uh -huh. of my work with her, over a thousand, twelve hundred, something like that, uh, hours uh -huh. of, of work, discussing everything, every idea, theory, practice, and what I was determined to do. In fact, she was such an example of what I consider the epitome of an artful therapist. I've seen a lot of people work, you know, especially conventions, but uh, I decided I've, I've got to be like this. Not exactly like uh -huh. her, but th it's possible to, be, to do therapy this way. I want to do it this way. And so I had to learn everything to be able to do that. That's my, my idea about it. Is I had to, and she kept saying, review that theory until you get it at your fingertips. Go deeper and deeper and deeper. And so my book was marked up. It was falling apart. But, you know, 22 times through the book, you begin to get it after a while. Was that the Ansbacher book? The Ansbacher book that, you know, <laughs> with the, the cover psychology. falling off and you have to get a new copy of it, but you want to use the old copy because it has all the marks, right, right. Uh, marks in it. Um, but you, you, you kind of reach a point where you have so much information about it and you've, you've understood so much about it. And it's like Sophia did so much automatically, intuitively. And I, that was not enough. I said, no, I have to understand why you did it and how you did it. And essentially what I would do is go into everything, including her technique of therapy, and saying, well, why do you do this first and then this second? And you know, what's the structure? And she says, I don't know. It's automatic. I said, we've got to figure it out. By the time I went through and, and she did it, she, she helped me figure this out Socratically. In a way, it's like I had to ask her questions. <laughs> and the more questions I asked her, the more I knew, you know, and then she would ask me questions until finally I would come up with the conclusion. She said, that sounds right to me. But I'd be asking her a question, but she sort of thought back. Well, finally I got this whole thing worked out, and I realized, wow, now I understand it. Well, what do you do when you understand it that thoroughly? It's like, maybe I should teach it. <laughs> After all, I have so many notes. Is really what it amounted to. What was it about? Uh, I mean, I, you were obviously so, just you know, tremendously impressed uh, by Sophia and her as a person, and her, also her technique. And yeah. uh, you know, what is it that uh, about the Socratic dialogue uh, that appealed to you? I mean, how did when uh, did you when did you realize the the impact of her Socratic dialogue with you. I mean, did you When did I realize know, that? When did you know what she was Probably doing? Probably took me about 30 <laughs> minutes <laughs> to realize that here's a way of uh -huh. talking to people that's uh -huh. absolutely fascinating, uh -huh. that is very respectful, mm -hmm. that helps you draw out a person's thinking and feeling, but that you also can guide them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, to know that it's being done to you it's, you don't object to it. Uh -huh. It's like, I love it. Okay. I want to be able to do that, too. Okay. Um, but how to do that was really tough to figure out. Because it, it, it looks so easy when it's done. It looks so logical when it's done. But the principles behind it took a long time to kind of figure out. And um, as I discovered, there was virtually nothing written about this of any value. A little bit about using it in the law, legal profession, a little bit in education, which is a slight distortion, but we had to put it together. Well, in the, in the Adler, uh, the, the books Adler makes references uh, times to the questioning and therapy, uh, but he doesn't really expound upon it. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly you've uh, 
you have expounded upon it. Uh, well, I've taken it tremendously deeply because yeah. I find it absolutely fascinating. And to me, it is the most interesting way to engage in a dialogue with somebody and to help them learn and, and to grow and to develop. Uh, no, I'm not sure. Are you, were you aware of the time? Because I think we're I have no about, idea. Are, are, are we? We are about uh, at, at our limit, I think. And uh, when did we about, start? Uh, oh my gosh! Yeah, I think we're at, we, we, we're going to limit this to 50 minutes and Fine. perhaps uh, uh, do the rest for another time. Uh, thank you and. Uh, uh, it's been very absorbing. I didn't even read one of my questions. I just kind of <laughs> we really got it. into it, didn't we? That was, I, that I was really terrific. Yeah. It. But thank you, thank you very much, and I hope that uh, uh, you know we can uh, continue this at some point. Thank you. Good. Okay.